You got your mama's sunshine. You got your daddy's rain. You're like a piece of heaven in a hurricane. And it's bubbling over. Hey guys, welcome to this week's like podcast. I am Josh Vietti. I'm here with Pastor Tom Touchstone, Pastor yeah. Ron Vietti. He's my dad, in case you guys are wondering what the relation is. Uh, and Vincent Sierra, yeah. who's my that's closest me. of clo- uh, closest of friends, and so that's why we will argue at some point during this podcast. I'm sure <laughs> sounds good, um, but uh, it's all in love. It's all in love, right? It is. I was talking to a guy yesterday, uh, yeah, two days ago, a couple days ago, and he told me how much he loves the podcast because we don't all agree on everything, and uh, and so you know, um, although I don't think we're going to argue a lot during this podcast, we might have different perspectives. Yeah, and that's a good thing, and so healthy. Um, yeah, exactly. So we're not afraid to tell one another. I don't agree with that. Yeah, we're not. Um, um, and it's not out of a it's not out of an attitude of disrespect. It's out of an attitude of respect, really. Right. That we uh, want to learn from each other. That's one beautiful thing I think uh, that that we have developed in our community. Uh, we all work for a church, and we all in, in that church. There's a strong community of believers and uh, and 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 people who are uh, devoted to uh, growth. Yeah. Right. We're devoted to growth, and in that, I think the um, permission to see a different perspective is really important. Mm. And so I uh, thank you guys for offering that to us and allowing us to, in respect, uh, uh, disagree on some things. But, you know, I always hear your guys' opinions and thoughts, and um, and ultimately we all anchor it to the Bible, and that's mm. what we believe in. Yeah. So, And iron sharpens iron, the Bible says. Yeah. We, we want to disagree sometimes. Sure. And we want to be transparent and honest with our audience. And so... Uh, Real quickly, give them the topic of the day. Okay, so today's topic is, uh, it sounds ominous and it sounds terrible, and you you might want to turn it off when I say it, but... Don't. Don't, because it's going to be really encouraging, I promise. But today we're going to talk about death. And um, and death is something that we don't like to always talk about. You know, I'm sure every group has the morbid guy or, go- or girl, right? The one that wants to talk about this stuff, and everybody's like, what? What are you doing? What's going on here? Uh, And we're not going to be morbid, but we do need to talk about this because the truth is we're all going to die. Yeah. No, no. If, if God doesn't come back and the world doesn't end, uh, we're all going to die. Yep. All of us are in the process of dying right now. Pastor, isn't it true that minutes or seconds after you're born, your cells start to die? That's a real morbid (laughs) way to look at babies. Well, you know, I was looking on the internet. Death is the end of life. It's, according to the internet, a permanent stoppage of heart, respiration, and brain activity. And I thought this was very intriguing. I Googled this, and it says three parts of death, the three levels of death. Number one is when your body ceases to function. That's the first level. Number two is when your body is consigned to the grave. And number three, that moment sometimes in the future when your name is spoken for the very last time. Now, I looked at National Geographic this week, and... It had an article, Why Can't We Live Forever? And and it went on to say, naturally, as time passes, our cells undergo changes. Our DNA mutates, our cells stop dividing, and harmful junk byproducts of cellular activity builds up. All of this moves toward aging. Aging moves to death. And then I saw National Geographic for Kids and it had a headlined article that says, could humans live forever? And then I love this line. I hate the line, but I love it. It says, if we could, why would we even want to? And I thought to myself, such a grim, hopeless, narrow-minded uh, view and approach to death. Uh, scientists are trying to stop aging, and so is Hollywood, and that's kind of funny, you know. Uh, we see all these cosmetic surgeries, and some people, bless their heart, their faces look like plastic. It looks like it, right. it would hurt to even laugh. I mean, some of them, you know, it looks pretty good. Others, it's looking pretty bad. And we go for the Corvettes as we get older, and nothing wrong with Corvettes, and we get our gold chains, and and there's nothing wrong with cosmetic surgery. Uh, It has been said before that if the barn needs painting, paint it. Uh, That's a good way to put it. (laughs) If if you need cosmetic surgery, bless your heart and get it. If you can afford it, great. And so we're not unbalanced. But there's a line, there's a boundary of trying to, to not age. We're trying not to die. Mm. Uh, people are freezing their bodies in liquid nitrogen. Wow. And uh, they hope to be brought back to life somewhere along the line when the scientists figure all this out. One company charges $200,000 uh, to preserve and restore your body. Or wow. preserve and store your body. 
Uh, they, they, they store it away for you. They preserve it with uh, liquid nitrogen. What's the stuff in Star Wars they use? You know what I'm talking about? I'm just yeah. thinking. Of, well, yeah. it's not a fun topic. You know, it's not. I, I sat down with a guy a couple of days ago who has been given a um, kind of a grim outlook on, on some cancer that he was uh, diagnosed with. And um, it was interesting sitting down with him. And one of the things he told me was he had this bucket list before. And then after he was told that, you know, he has this long to live. And, and I think that there is some hope for him other outside of this. But, but the doctors have to say, you know, this is, the, this is what we have right now for you. And what we have right now for you is this is how long you have. This is what we can tell you. And uh, he said that his entire bucket list, uh, none of it was important all of a sudden. And, and he had a whole new list. That was really important. That's neat. I told you the 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 uh, song I have on my phone is "Live Like You're Dying." What a weird thing to be going through life, and um, and we we we're told when we're younger that we're gonna die when we're older, um, but there's no timetable on that. And all of a sudden, um, at some point, middle of your life, you get told that you all of a sudden your your clock has an expiration. I mean, what was yeah. that like when somebody told you, like when you knew that when you went to the doctor and they said. You're, you're, only, you're good as dead. You got you, three or four years left. Yeah, yeah, or whatever. They gave you a time. I mean, it what feels, was that? Uh, from I, knowing, from not knowing when you're going to die to like I, them rem- putting a time on it. I remember like it was yesterday. Like it was yesterday. All of a sudden, I felt numb. I felt numb. I sat in this room going, somebody pinch me, wake me up. And I remember precisely getting in the elevator at Samson Clinic, going down. People were talking about this weekend, we're going to go. We're going to do this, this, this. And all I keep thinking was, I'm done. I'm through. I'm finished. My life is over. Wow. It was it, it was shock set in. Shock. I thought, did I just really hear what I heard? And how many years ago was that Pascal? Gosh, what over 20? 20. Yep. Wow. And uh and everything else kind of seemed meaningless. I at just that everything point. at that right. point. But I, I digested it quickly because of my belief system. Right. And, uh, 20, I, 26 I, years ago. Josh, Josh, it was 26. Wow. 26. Because you were senior, you were a sophomore. I was in high 16 school? years old, yeah. Wow. Uh, I remember though that night, it was the funniest thing. Because I was told I had four years to live, and, and the doctor said it was pretty definite. Because at that time, there was no no pill, no anything. And when I asked him my chances of living past four years, uh, Dr. Charles Sawyers put his head down. He wouldn't look at me, and he says, you don't have a chance, probably. And it was very emphatic. But that night, we were in bed, and at 3 in the morning, I kept telling him, can't you sleep? I said, I can't sleep. I don't know, did I take caffeine today? Da, 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 da. I said, wait. I just told I was going to die 12 hours ago. <laughs> right. Now I know why we start laughing. Yeah. And uh, But to, today on the broadcast, I, w- I want to get to some stuff. And I don't know how fast you want to go, Josh. I, I, I Josh, I'm kind of, he had kind of fallen his lead. But I want to talk about near-death experiences. I want to talk about out-of-the-body experiences. I want to talk just, about just a lot of stuff. start where you want to start. I mean, I think okay. that this is a subject that, um, you know, I don't, no, if this is the case, but if I were to theorize, I would theorize that most people uh, put this in the back of their head. They don't want to think about it. Josh, and, and funerals, funerals. When you do funerals, right? Oh boy, how many have we? I, I, we've all done them. All of us have done. Yeah, them. Well, that's what's weird about feel. me is like if. So I, I was thinking about you and I, Dad, how we grew up differently, and I think that, and you you don't realize this sometimes. I don't think because you're like, oh, you grew up. You know, I was I raised you and all that. But you grew up in, when you were young, you grew up in what I would say was a religious home, right? Yeah, I did. And I say, I, I believe I grew up in yeah. more of a spiritual home mm-hmm. um, where we talked, you talked about everything, you know, you didn't talk about people, but you talked about going to the funerals and doing these things. And de- I, I was, I grew up talking about death. I grew up thinking about death. I grew up uh, thinking about all these things. So when I talk about it these days, my friends think I'm kind of morbid because I just will talk about it very nonchalant. I'll be like, yeah, you, you know. And blah, you, blah. You, you grew up on the Exorcist movie set, too. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I mean, pretty oh, much. Man. Very spiritual. <laughs> well, just, just, very spiritual. Just all the yeah. experiences that yeah. your dad I, I would, would come have. home late at night going, I just did a deliverance. Yeah. And Josh yeah. probably, his eyes big around his saucers go, what? <laughs> I was a right. child and I was developing at that time. And so uh, if you guys maybe, want to Maybe know, that's the reason you yeah, went through a trial. There could be some reasons. Day. Yeah, there's some stuff there. But I remember one of our vacations specifically was this older couple that died and uh and grandpa uh mom's uh, dad was a pastor and he knew these people and he had ministered to them and <laughs> and uh, we went and stayed in their in their mobile home and they had just died and that's wild and uh it was the weirdest thing ever and, it, and we felt like it was haunted it was a whole thing well i was looking through the cupboard and we had weird stuff happening weird. lights going out weird i mean stuff. noises sounds and, and and because they hid money in this trailer 
I was told they hid money all over, so I'm searching for everything. Well, they left location. everything to Grandpa. They, they left did. They left it. Left it. They didn't have any family. And yeah. as I was searching, and weird stuff going on, so much so we went and got a hotel room. As I was searching, a piece of the newspaper floated down, and I picked it up, and that was the anniversary of his death, the guy that lived there. And I go, ooh, you know. Yeah, so. <laughs> and this was much, and there's a lot more stories that go along with that. Yeah. This is my childhood. So. Uh, That's your upbringing. This you is my you upbringing. should have emotional problems. Yeah, I mean, I should have a very different view. And so oh, yeah. uh, when I talk about it, I talk about very, very nonchalant, but I also yeah. grew up believing in that death isn't the end, that it's uh, it's the graduation. It's a, it's a moving from one dimension to another, basically. And, um, you know, that's a mind blow for a lot of people, yeah. but... You know, there's all these shows. Uh, I'm watching some show. I'm watching the show out, uh, Outer Range, that show. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah. It's actually okay. really good. It's it is interesting. Good. Yeah. Kind of uh, along the same lines of that spiritual side of things. And I haven't gotten, I'm not done with it yet. So don't ruin it okay, for me. Okay, so I won't, yeah. I'm like halfway through. Well, what a difference between people who live believing they're going to live forever mm -hmm. and, and that they'll see their family again, be reunited with them, and others that think, I'm going to die, I'm going to go to sleep into my existence yeah nothing beyond well, this. They, i'll never see my family again have you ever talked to somebody about big difference. about a big subject like heaven heaven or hell or uh or death or whatever and they just get really defensive all of a sudden they get yeah. really upset like i don't want to talk about that i don't want to talk about that i always am concerned about people that are afraid to talk about it yeah funerals are very interesting because a lot of people are very uncomfortable because they have to come face to face with something they've been trying to put out of their mind. The tension level at a tension funeral. Tension level is huge. Is high. Yeah. I read this article where they said religious people, and this is and when I say religious people, not spiritual people per se, but religious people actually fear death more than people who don't believe. Mm. And it comes off the premise of the way that they're living their life, that they don't want to have to come to terms, like you said, and meet their maker mm. and then figure it out, did I do it the right way? Does that make sense versus people that, and then they said there's the people that don't believe and there's a big majority of them that have a big fear of not just knowing in general, just what you talked about. Who was the guy that said, I, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it's really know. interesting. Well, the people we're talking to you today, we don't know what you Where guys are going at. through. Yeah. yeah. And there might be people that are listening to this who just got diagnosed with cancer there might be people that are live that are listening to this who have heart failure. There are people who have just lost a loved one, and so I think that this this subject could be really freeing for them. So, you you found out that you had so long to live, and you you I know you got into a funk for a minute, but then something changed in you, and you started fighting. Uh, can well, you talk about that for a minute, yeah, real quickly? And I can say this with transparency and honesty, knowing God as my witness. When I heard I was dying the first time around, um, you know what? I think I only had like three or four bad days in the whole year or two that I, on paper I was dying. I could test to that, Pastor, because okay. I was around you a lot. I, I was pretty happy. I was pretty joyous. Yeah. And it was the joy of the Lord, I think, that filled my heart. But, uh, you know, I, I did have two or three down moments. Uh, you know, one day we Here's my memory. Okay, and maybe this will this will uh, okay. spark yours. You 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 call me on the way back from yeah. the doctor. Say right. hey, you know it's bad news. I'm you know told me what's going on, and there's a lot of quiet. There's some crying, yeah. you know, uh, some sadness. Yeah, and then I feel like that lasted maybe a week or oh, so, maybe, maybe longer. Max, no, no, not over a week. And all of a sudden, I walked into the kitchen, and there's a slab of grass. On the kitchen, <laughs> on the kitchen uh, uh, counter, no, and uh, it was wheatgrass. I was grinding it. Up. It was wheatgrass, and I Juicing didn't know it. it. In, in my mind, I'm like, why is there a slab of sod uh, in our kitchen? What's going on? And then I saw him come in and cutting it with uh, scissors, and then he's throwing it in the. I remember the juicer, the and, and I'm like, what is happening? I remember seeing it in Porterville for the first time, and he's just sitting there, and I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like making grass. I'm like, huh? Yeah, because like, Vince has been close to our family too. Oh, man. But I am by nature a fighter. Yeah. I don't lay down and just take stuff. Mm -hmm. I remember you had stacks and, uh, of books. You had a bunch of printouts. You had oh, all kinds I was after it. This is before, I was after it. This is really before the internet. Right. I mean, right. the internet had just... Right. right. You couldn't go just, Google stuff. Right. Well, when I had left for the doctor that morning, see, we had then, we had these medical books, remember? And so you look up symptoms and everything. These are, the books are from Hale. They should have been thrown away. Because every time that I heard somebody had some, I'd go Google it and I had it too. But before I left for the doctor, I told your mother, I said, I think I have leukemia. And she just kind of went, oh, Ron, you don't have leukemia. It's uh, You got an infection in your body or something. I said, no, I think I do. And she didn't believe me. So I went with myself. But anyway, making a long story short, getting it off of me, the subject off of me, 
Uh, I got a lot to say. But I, think I, it's, I, I do think it's somewhere. important uh, to, to talk about why you fought. Okay, why I fought. Well, number one, I, first thing I did, and I don't want to get too far ahead, but I have this radical, radical, radical belief in God. So I start going to God saying, am I going to live or die, live or die? And I wrote out five years of birthday cards to you and your sister. And I told your mother, I should read it to him every year. And so, you know, uh, I just wanted to know from God. I wanted to hear from him, am I going to live or die? Because you're God, you know all things. And once he began to tell me, and I know a lot of people are going to really have a hard time with that statement. I just want to say to you, God does speak to people. He does. He does. And he does it in ways that you can go back and get our other podcast where we talk about hearing God's voice. And once I really felt God told me that I was going to live, I did something unique. I, uh, the Bakersfield Californian, there's still a, a copy of it. I have a copy of it somewhere on, on a big, I forgot what page it was on, big headlines. Uh, something was like a local section. Yeah, local section said, pastor says uh, he's not going to die and he's going to prove God's real, whatever. And so once I felt I'd heard God that I wasn't going to die, everything changed for me. And I went to the congregation one day and I said, look, I feel like God has spoken to me and said, I'm not going to die of this cancer. And I said, now here, if you want to look, here's some medical reports that says I am going to die. I mean, I'm not just making this up. But I said, I want you to do me a favor. I said, act like you're in a movie theater, watching a movie, go get some popcorn and watch me. If I die like the doctors say I'm going to die, then write me off. Just, just say, disregard me. But if I don't die, you better listen to what I'm saying. I, I've, I've tapped into a higher resource, or a higher source, I should say. So, uh, Can I even say this, Pastor? Yes. Because I remember the Wednesday night Doug flew in from um, Colorado, Colorado and announced yep. it. Something happened that next Sunday, almost like... <laughs> 400 people were they gone. Left, they left the church. There, there was obviously enough. And I remember you came out and you looked around and you go, find time to leave me, Lucille. Yeah, let's sing that song, find so, time so, to leave so, me, Lucille. So that's setting the page for you to say, hey, listen, yeah. you might think I'm going to die. You might go to another church. Yeah. But hey, don't lose track of where I'm at because mm. if I am, if I do live, you know, sit back, get a popcorn, yeah. watch a movie. But if I am, if I don't die, you better come back because the you, proofs I'm, in the pudding. Yeah, so that's a revealing too proofs in the pudding. of of maybe the majority of people, um, you know, the crowd, so to speak. In in any crowd, you have a majority of people that are there for one reason or another, and it kind of proves that at that time those people were there kind of for the wrong reasons. They were there because they wanted stability or they wanted, well, uh, you know. Well, your dad, your dad was very funny. He was quite humorous. I mean, he was entertaining. I mean, yeah, very entertaining. <laughs> Is that I mean, you're very. I mean, he was. I mean, he's had a saying that you know people would come, he'd get on fire for God and come people. Some people would come watch him burn. Yeah, you know. But he would. He, but but he would very. He, you know, he has a very infectious personality, a very infectious uh, lifestyle, and a very uh, uh, desirable. Uh, um, a spiritual life. Okay. And so people would come and all of a sudden they're like, well, we better go someplace else because he won't be here. Yeah. But I think that's the yeah. very thing that the message is all about. They're missing the whole point. Aren't See, I, think, I think my purpose in life is to prove to people God's yes. real. Yeah. In, in one sense, I can't prove it to them, but I mean, I can at least live influence it out. Well, a, lot right. people, it out. a lot of people, and I've, I've learned this, that a lot of, just through growing, through growing up in the church, a lot of people will protect themselves emotionally when there's bad news, and so they will they will yeah, distance from themselves yeah. because they don't want to have to deal with the emotions of letting go. And can I know? say, or even should I say, that I, I have another cancer today. That cancer has all been taken care of, totally according to God's Word. And then I have another one today. And as I sit here, it's not life-threatening at the moment at all. It could become life-threatening down the road. And again, I felt God has said that not to worry about it. Um See, I, I, I gave out years ago green cards to all the people in the congregation. The green card kind of says that Ron Vietti's allowed to be on this earth until my purpose for him is finished, then he has to go home. Mm. God's purpose for me is not finished yet. I, I know that 100%. So, uh, again, we, we look at death totally different than a lot of people look at it. And I want to get into, like, near-death experiences. Almost 9 million people have had night, the near-death experiences. The New York Post says 5% of the population have had near-death experiences. Um, and, and I'm telling you, we've got to talk about these. And before we do, I want to say, I think there's a large percentage of near-death experiences that are bogus. Near-death experiences have nothing to do 
with the Bible, the way it, it talks about death and the afterlife. I think what I'm impressed with the most about near-death experiences is I think many of them, in my mind, actually prove another thing called out-of-body experiences. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that, and we're going to talk more about that, so stay tuned, call your friends, tell them to tune in or whatever. But I believe that we have almost proven that there's life outside of the body. And I want to talk about what some of the, uh, you know, other side, the atheists, the scientists are saying and why they're saying it. Right. But uh, Because a lot of people say when you die, there's a chemical that release that causes causes you to hallucinate, right? And that's why they kind of write off. Yeah, there's not enough oxygen in the brain. Right, right, yeah. And on and on. But what you got to see is this, and I don't know... Let's just talk about it now. Okay. Um, There's many scientists out there that have to disprove this. Okay. In fact, you got to think about it. Uh, They are going into this study of -of out-of-the-body experiences and near-death experiences. They're going in biased. Um, The scientific world, much of it, vehemently does not believe in the Bible or the God of the Bible, and they must must disprove near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences. They have no choice. Uh, They are very, very close-minded at the outset of their studies. They're narrow-minded, they're prejudiced, they're biased, they're determined that they, they don't want to see it any other way than what they see it. Because if they see it the way we preach it and the way we believe it to be true, they're stuck. Then they got to believe in this God of the Bible, and they don't want to believe in this God of the Bible. I think many of the scientific world out there sees us Christians as archaic. Uh, they see us as pathetic, ignorant uh, people that aren't educated, that have to have life after death, and they want to make Christians, some do, some, not all, make us look uneducated, pathetic, like idiots, Um and so, I mean, it's just like, for example, I, I was reading some atheist the other day, and he was trying to disprove Christianity based on the Bible, uh, and basically said something like this, you know, the Bible, the Old Testament, man, they kill babies, kill women, and they did this, they stoned people, blah, 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 blah. I cannot believe in this kind of God, so I'm throwing the whole baby out, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Right. But these same scientists... Although evolution has its missing links, it has all kinds of gaps in it. A lot, they yeah. don't throw evolution out because of some things they don't understand, right. but they're throwing the Bible out for a few things they don't understand, and they don't understand it because they've never studied them. Right. They don't know the first thing about it. Now, well, uh, I'm starting to preach, aren't I? No, yeah, I like but, that. I was about to say yes, well, amen. Well, well, <laughs> but, but you know, Pastor, I'm going to say this, because it's the same people that can want to make us look ridiculous, that want to talk to us, about hope when they get in that circumstance. Yeah, their kids Don't in they, the Pastor? hospital dying. Yeah. Who do they come to? Well, right. well Pastor, I mean, I've, I've seen it happen with you, yeah. and I've seen it happen in other circumstances because people do want the hope that John 3, 16 says. Yes. Jesus so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so whoever believeth will have eternal life because that means something to somebody at that point when they're facing They it. want to believe. Yes. There, there are people watching you and I, Tom, and Josh and Vince, and they want what we're saying to be true. Yes, they do. But they're skeptical. They're hope. They and so hope. they're watching us, wanting to see us fail, on the other hand, too, because they don't believe it's real. It's interesting that you mentioned uh, uh, early civilization or ancient civilization that, um, you know, they think that we're archaic in our thinking because we don't believe in afterlife. But even, you know, take out Christianity, which that's our base, but you take out all that. All of these early ancient religions <laughs> all pointed to some kind of afterlife. Yes. It was never without, I mean, even from the beginning. So, you know, wherever you believe or land on a spectrum, it isn't just, you know, Christianity, Christianity or Judaism. It's very early, you know, these different religions that came in, they all believed in this afterlife. But they'll just say, they'll say it's because of weak humanity. Right. We just have to have this this desire to live beyond. Right. right. They all, but they uh, all came to that conclusion, right? Without. It's just interesting from the very beginning that we just we couldn't live without that idea that we knew that we weren't that we weren't just because that we came from a creator and so that's just something to definitely think about you know because I love that you brought up the atheist point of view um, and wherever you're at in the spectrum this isn't casting judgment on the you know on that segment I just there is a lot of holes on both sides and as you narrow down and you start looking back it, I think you have to always come back and be like but 
It was, it's but so yeah. funny because we've all known vil, uh, mil, uh, veterans, and veterans have a saying: "This is no unbelievers in a foxhole." Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Interesting. You know, I like that. I'm just, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying. I, yes. I, I, right. I, I think you even have the skeptics who want that hope. They want that faith and they want that belief, and so they grab onto and gravitate. I do believe secretly to. That hope. But it's not fair to approach a subject with a closed mind. No, sure. I agree. And they are. I mean, I think the majority of our scientists, because many of them are atheistic in their beliefs, agnostic or whatever. And so they're approaching this subject already biased going into it. We've got to prove it wrong. To, to just real quick, I just want to make a comment about that too. I think what happens too with the, and I'm not saying all atheists, so we're not trying to generalize all people that don't believe, but in general, religion, not all sects of Christianity, has taken the scientific realm of the world and just kind of scoff that it's you or Christians don't, don't put the science together. Right. And the, and that's also ignorance. So there is a lot of science, you know, in general of like, you know, like we hear a lot of people say, well, why should I care about the earth and protecting whatever? It's like, well, you know, we're here and God's given us this earth. To, right. to, so I could be wrong, wrong with this statement because I haven't, I don't know how you can find this, st the stats on this, but I believe there are probably more agnostics, people that don't necessarily believe in one thing, but sure, they, believe yes. in, they believe in the possibility no. of something. Sure. Then there are atheists, atheists right? Yes. People that are just flat sure. out say, I don't believe, believe in nothing. Right. Because atheism in itself is almost a religion. Yeah. Uh, they take it upon themselves to, I think of Ricky Gervais. He's, a, right. he's an atheist and he's very vocal about it. They take it upon themselves to disprove God. Um, and I think that that's a, I think that's a, that's a small amount of people. Sure. The people that, um, that believe in something thinking like Joe Rogan type yeah. people that believe in something, but they haven't find, they haven't landed on a specific like Jesus. Um, why, why, what makes, what makes Jesus different in his, in his view of death and his view of life? Mm. Uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, just a, I'm just guessing here. Um, I think that his view is um, is much more hopeful and much more um, encouraging than than a lot of people's view and a lot of other religions' views because of what he did to prove his theory, right? He said, there's life after death, and I'm going to give my life and up. And he backed it up. Yeah, he backed it up, exactly. You know, and then, then these scientists, like I, I saw a study of, with Alzheimer's patients and people with Parkinson's disease, and so they analyzed them, and they said that this, 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 you know, these hallucinations or whatever they call them, are, are due to dysfunction of the pathways of dopamine and and neurotransmitters and on and on and on. They can't compare right. one thing to another like that. Those are totally different things. Oh, they're trying so hard. Uh, case studies. Let's go to some case studies. I mean, what do you do with this? You know. Try, scientists are trying to dismantle these things right and left. The infamous that I've told for 40 years uh, is the case of, of Maria who died of a heart attack. She was visiting some relatives or friends in Seattle in 1977, and she was rushed to the Harborview Hospital with a heart attack. And while she was in the resuscitation process, um, she left her body. She was a migrant farm worker, left her body, came back and told the doctors about it, and they didn't believe her. And she said, if you don't believe me, there is a uh, tennis shoe on the third floor of the hospital. It's blue. It's a sneaker. And it has a wear mark over the little toe, and one lace is tucked under the heel. She said, you'll find it up there. And she shared this story with social worker Kimberly Clark. And so sure enough, Kimberly heard her say this, and this little lady, she had nothing to prove. And she said, please go find that tennis shoe. Went up on the third floor. It was the color. It was the shoestring in the right place, everything. She said, I was out of my body. Now, today, they're trying to totally disregard that whole story because they said, we can't get a hold of her. We don't know where she's at anymore. All we have is this Kimberly Clark, which is like a really right on lady that heard the story. So they try to write that off. Um, uh, uh, you see... U UK Medical Journal. He's trying to read his own notes. Yeah. <laughs> I, wrote this, I wrote a few of these down. The UK Medical Journal, The Lancet, vetted and published this account. Uh, a a cardiac, cardiac arrest patient was brought into a Dutch hospital, unresponsive and not breathing. The medical staff removed his dentures to insert a ventilation tube. 
And they stored his teeth in the drawer of a nearby cash cart. Days later, when the patient wanted his dentures back, he regained consciousness. He was told that they, the dentures were lost in the chaos of the moment. But the patient said, I know exactly where they're at. He said, I was out of my body and I saw where you put them. They're in that drawer over there. He went on to explain everything that happened in the room that day wow. while he was out of his body watching. And, uh, you know, I could go on and on. And this kind of makes me mad. Uh, Dr. Mary Neal, there's some doctors. I want to talk about some very influential people. Mm -hmm. Dr. Mary Neal, she's UCLA trained orthopedic surgeon, director of spinal surgery at USC, now in private practice, died while kayaking down a waterfall in Chile. She went to heaven, saw God, the angels, the greeting party. Uh, she was annoyed because her friends were praying for her to come back, on and on. Now, she did a TED Talks, and it was really cool TED Talks. And after she did it, they removed it from the air. They said, our policies are not in agreement with these kind of subjects. Hmm. They removed her from the air. Now, I could go on and on. Uh, the supernatural uh, verse versus the fact of reasoning. The debate goes on. Mm. What did Jesus say in John 11, 25, 26? I am the resurrection of life. I'm in, Ron, slow down. You're okay, buddy. It's I keep a, thinking I'm talking too much. I Real gave quick. you an extra dose of caffeine today on that. You did. You did. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm the resurrection of life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies and every single person who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Okay, mm. now, now what do we do with this? Uh, we've got thousands, and I'm going to give you books after you can buy, thousands and millions and, and hundreds of, 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 of examples and illustrations. Somebody says, I died. I had an out-of-body experience. And I want to come back and tell you, I saw Aunt Matilda and Uncle Joe on the other side, but they haven't died. I don't understand that. And the relatives would look at them and go, oh, they did die a week ago mm. while you were in the hospital. I mean, wow. we, got, we got a lot of stories like this. Wow. Kids describe loved ones they've never seen, and they go, that was grandpa. And they go, what? Uh, a blind woman sees. I love this one. She, she's out of her body, over by the window, watching everything they're doing to her body. A pin falls out of the doctor's pocket near the window where she was at, he walks over, picks it up, puts it back in his pocket, and she tells him about this. And you know what he said? Hallucinations because of lack of oxygen to the brain. Mm. Doesn't even want to approach it. Uh, a man described, uh, the, I mean, I've read these for my whole life. He, he described the kind of saw and what it looked like that they used while he was dead to saw into his chest. Whoa. And he describes it. He describes the color of the wallpaper. He said that they were playing ABBA while he, they, they were working on him and he was dead. In one case, they were holding his heart in his hand. They had actually killed the person. He was dead. I mean, there's absolutely, I mean, wild. we've got story after story after story after Dr. Eben Alexander, a neurosurgeon who taught and practiced several prestigious universities, Harvard, everywhere. He was a skeptic. He was one of those guys saying there's no life after death until it happened to him. Wrote his book and he said, I wasn't hallucinating. He said, being in heaven was one of the most real things that could ever happen to anybody. It was more real than real, hmm. more real. Than this. So all these people are coming out. Don Piper, a guy that I met on a set in, on TV down in L.A., uh, I could go on and on and on. We've had two guys in our pulpit that have had death and beyond. Um, what was the guy's name? We had Dr. Richard Eby, but the other guy uh, forgot his name. But I could go on and on. Who do you want to believe? Socrates, Socrates believed in immortality of the soul. Uh, Plato, same thing. So we want to discount Plato, Socrates. We want to take all these, these near-death experiences and say they're invalid or out-of-body experiences, I should say, because, again, I'm a pastor. I do not believe all these fit biblically in the Bible. I did a whole Easter sermon one time on what I think these people are experiencing. I don't think it proves anything about heaven and the Bible. I just think it does nearly prove that there's life out of the body. That's all I'm saying. It's interesting. I don't take any further than that. It's interesting that some of the people in these stories um, have no skin. It isn't like they're, they were out to prove something. They were just normal people. They weren't part of, you know, some big church organization or anything. These are just people that, you know, 
had experienced this and then came to the conclusion that, hey, there is something else that happens after you I die. I like that, Vince. They're not out to prove anything. Maria right. was a migrant farm worker. It's, it's immigrant, right. immigrant, it's, migrant. It's, right. it's yeah. funny because I'm going to share Caffeine something. Yeah. No, my, yeah, that's... I'm going to share something happened with my wife, and I've shared it with Pastor Ron, and I've shared it from the pulpit a couple of times. My wife uh, was uh, real ill, and she had her colon removed at UCLA um, Medical Hospital. And uh, uh, her doctor's name was Jonathan um, Sack. And he was a colorectal surgery, and he was head of the academic department. And uh, I remember getting a call from him one day, and he says, Tom, you got to come down here because there's something going on with your wife. So I went down there. She, she, ha- she was there for 45 days. I went down there. And it was late in the evening, and uh, they had to rush her to radiology, and they did a uh, um, scan, and um, the um, uh, radiology tech didn't realize it was there and uh, made a few comments on how serious it was. And he looked at me and goes, man, I'm sorry. So uh, I was there with my wife when we went up to her room, but the doctor pushed us back in, and the elevator went down into the operating room. So they told me that they were going to save my wife's life and kick me out. So my, uh, I asked, where's Jonathan Sack at? And they go, he's coming in right now. He's having dinner, but he's coming in to operate on your wife. And I remember him uh, coming up to me before he operated and says, hey, listen, this should take about four hours. And if it's longer, it, you know, I probably have some stuff going on. Now, Jonathan Sack was a believer. He, was, uh, he had his um, 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 medical school with University of Florida. He was a general residency, uh, uh, resident surgery of training in Alabama, uh, of Birmingham. And he was the head at UCLA. So he was about six hours of surgery, and uh, he came out, and he was covered in blood, and I realized it was my wife's blood. Wow. And uh, uh, Dr. Sack looked at me, and he goes, Tom, I think I've seen my first bona fide miracle. And I was like, well, how's that? And he goes, well, we have two uh, um, obvious x-rays of your wife, because they were in the room when I got there, and there was two holes in her um, small intestine, which I constructed for her at once I removed her colon, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And he goes, so it was obvious so when I opened her up, she had standing, freestanding pustule, which was an indication of um, uh, peritonitis. And I went there and looked, and then I started to run her colon. And I ran it one way, and it takes a little bit of time. And I found no holes, and I ran it back the other way, found no holes, looked at my attendant, and said I need to do it again. Ran it another way, no holes. And he says, what do you think? He goes, I want you to run it the other way. He goes, we have no holes. But he goes, I've uh, stapled your wife's stomach back up because I need to go in tomorrow. And I just got to tell you, there's a 10% chance that she'll survive the night because I may have missed something. And if that's the case, she won't survive. So 90% chance she might die? That was the figure that I came up mm. with. I said, so you got to understand that I'm working with a 90%. And he goes, yeah. And I go, I want to see my wife. He goes, well, she's going to be out. And I'm going to go back in tomorrow. So be here at 5.30. I was there bright and early at 5.30. I left my mother-in-law at the hotel I walked in, and I walked into my wife, and she was sitting in the bed completely upright. I think I've shared wow. this story yeah. with you. Yeah. And, and she looked at me. just like regular day. She looked at me, and she goes, Tom, I'm going to tell you what happened last night. I prayed that God would take me. And um, instead of that, Jesus was in my room. Wow. And it's cool. cool. Hmm. She said, Jesus is in my room, and he said, Tiffany, not yet. My wife doesn't share this story. I share it for her, and I've already asked her if I could share it. I knew our podcast today. And, uh, and she had this experience of, mm. you know, that, you know, God gave me this. Un- he, he said, Tom, it was the most amazing experience. The peace was there. No one can tell me he wasn't in my room. Yeah. And she said, and he just told me, I'm going to use you and on earth. And so I was sitting there and the Dr. Jonathan Sack walked in. And he looked at me, looked at my wife, and he said, get out. So I got out. Half hour later, he walked out and he goes, so did you talk to your wife? And I said, I did. He goes, did he, she tell you everything? I go, about Jesus? Yes, she did. <laughs> and he was a believer. And he goes, Tom, he goes, most amazing thing I've seen. But it was also Lynn's credence that I didn't find any holes in her um, small intestine last night. And he goes, Tom, I'm not going to touch your wife. I said, wow. but you said you needed to reoperate. He goes, wow. Tom, I'm not. Fast forward, my wife never needed another surgery. Six months later, we're in the, his office with my mother-in-law and my wife. And he goes, Tom, he goes, man, that was the craziest thing I've ever seen. Never experienced anything like that. And I go, oh, yeah, me too. And he goes, Tiffany goes, what are you guys talking about? And he looked at her and he goes, so you didn't tell her? I go, I think (laughs) I just lost track of things and we didn't go go through everything. So he said, let me tell the story. Wow. And, Wow. and, And as my wife was there, I can tell you, 
that I saw something happen. I've asked Pastor Ron this. I've read every book I could on this subject. My wife just had an experience that my wife today, by 5 o'clock, if Jesus came back, would be just fine with it. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought, why is that? I think I asked you, Pastor Ron, and I think she's already seen what being in Jesus' presence is like. Yeah. It's amazing. And anybody else that was in his presence. Now, that's a story that, as I've told, I'll tell my doctor, my, my wife again. I asked Dr. Jonathan Sack. You can look him up. 45 years in Los Angeles at colorectal surgery. Uh, a believer. I mean, he, I said, I'm going to use this story. He goes, feel well, free to use it. Well, because he goes, I do. And I don't know where he shared it. But here's a medical scientist yeah. Yeah. trained and saw something. See, they're trying to, some of the people out there, are trying to put us in a category as idiots and, again, you know, just pathetic people. There's a lot of influential people on our side, very educated yes. people. Josh, isn't it true that we've either discovered something that is so radically cool and good or we're pathetic individuals? Everybody needs to feel sorry for us. You know, I, I, I tend we're to... Delu we're delusional. I tend to um, lean heavily toward this side, because of my upbringing, of course, but also because I've seen, in my upbringing, I've seen that when people deal with death, they deal with it, either it's a near-death experience or even um, they believe they're going to die, they've been told they're going to die. Uh, I've seen pretty much every single one of those people turn their life to living their life, like actually living their life. Yeah. And I feel like before they were kind of playing it safe or they were, you know, they were living like a lot of us do where you're conservative about a lot of things. But I, I've seen people that, that almost die say, well, if I didn't die um, and death is not so bad, which a lot of them believe, right? they, they start living the life that they were supposed to live. Ever, Two things, ever Josh. Two things that's heralded over and over again. And I've been around 55 years and I've read experience after. I've talked to people. Two things they keep saying over and over again. Number one is, I'm not afraid to ever die. Uh, Never. So and number two, they say it over and over again. When a doctor or someone says you're hallucinating, no oxygen to the brain, da, 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 they say, no, no, you don't understand. This experience was more real yeah. than anything in this life is real. I, one lady I was reading, she's blind. She's blind. And she comes back and tells them all these things that she saw while she was out of her body. Explains everything in detail. The color of hair the nurse had. Uh, what the doctor had on, everything. Okay, come on. How do you explain these things? Well, we don't. We try to write them off. We try to find a hole, make them look crazy, whatever. So here's something I find interesting. Here's really interesting. This is a thought for you guys. And I heard this in song, in a song lyric, actually. Uh, but they said, if you take the pieces of your body and put them together, right, and you make sure those pieces are perfect, you know, say someone dies and say that they, uh, you know, go through their entire body and renovate it. Like, like they a would car. a car engine, yeah, okay. right? Yeah. You go through, the veins are perfect, right. the heart is perfect, the, the, the blood, you know, everything is perfect. Right. Would there be life? Right. No, Could no. you resuscitate? Right. I know. Can you that's put great. the pieces yeah. together and make right. it work like right. you can a car? Right. Well, of course you can't, right? And so there's a part of uh, our lives that's a consciousness that can't be explained. And so to me, that right there proves that there's life after death. And when you die, your soul leaves the body. Leaves the body. Goes somewhere else. It, your consciousness goes somewhere else. You, right? And so that to me right there is proof. Like if you, if you, anything else in the world besides a living being, you can, you can put it together and it works right. fine. I don't so, know why right? we, we can't almost solidify and, and confirm today that we've almost proven that there's out-of-body experiences, and then you can take it from there. Let me suggest some books. One of my favorite books was Dr. Raymond Moody Jr., Life After Death. Another one, uh, Morris Rawlings has a book that I, I've read and I enjoyed, uh, Proof of Heaven, Even Alexander. And again, in some of these books, I'm going to tell you now, they say stuff that's not biblical, stuff that doesn't line up with Scripture. But again, one Sunday on Easter, I, I did this thing, and I, I use the illustration of like birds in a cage. And these birds, the only thing they know about their life is the cage. That, that's, that's their world, the cage. And then one day one gets out, say in our big 3,400-seat sanctuary, he's flying all over going, oh, my, there is life after the cage. And he's going over, and he zooms down, and he sees 
uh, Vince walked through and he goes, oh, there's a bean. I never seen this bean before. He was he was large and he, he would look like this and he had a this cap thing on and he sees Josh and all this stuff. So pretty soon they bring him back to the cage, which equals, you know, bringing them back from the near-death experience. And he tells all the birds, man, there's life out there. There's these people and there's this big building. See, they never got outside of the building, which is heaven and afterlife. So when you read some of these books, they say stuff that's not biblical. I, I, I don't validate what they're saying. I don't want to make sure that goes down for the record. All I validate is that they've had an out-of-body experience. That's all. Got well, there's it. people that uh, um, if you have an experience, right? And if I have an experience and, we, and you have a similar experience, we're going to see it different. We're going to explain them completely differently. And that's even in the Gospels. You know, why do we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? It's because they came from different perspectives, and those different perspectives right. explain it differently. Yep. And so I think that um, if you're talking about a near li- near death experience, um, <laughs> I almost said near life experience, which could be almost the same thing. Right. But when you talk about near death experiences, um, people are going to explain them differently. They're going to explain it based sure on are. how they saw. It, you sure know? they are. Well, and, Dr. Elizabeth Kubler Ross, uh, she has a, a book out, a, a bestseller, some time ago. And if I remember correctly, I haven't read her for decades, but she was the leading person on death and dying, yes, number one. She was. And I believe, Tom, if I remember correctly, she was a skeptic, like mm-hmm. Dr. Eben Alexander. But she kept hearing the story. She kept hearing them, and finally she investigated more, and finally she turned into a believer uh, in them. And so. What does skepticism uh, actually mean? I, I think it actually means, the, I don't know. Is what it means, right? I right. don't know, and right. so I'm not going to believe it. There's, we have some friends who climbed uh, 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 Mount Whitney, Whitney, Mount Whitney yeah. which is our local mountain, which is also the tallest mountain in the uh, in the uh, in this uh, mm-hmm. in northern North hemisphere. Yeah, in, in this yeah. In, the, in the lower 50, right? Yeah. And so uh, lower 48, sorry. Uh, but their perspective of climbing that mountain and my perspective of seeing that mountain as I drive up the 395 is different. I've always wanted right. to climb and have talked about it, but I've never actually done it. Right. They've done it. And I'm skeptical of what that's like because I don't know. I'm right. like, what is it like? Is it easy? Is it hard? Is it, you know, what what does it look like? I, I'm I'm skeptical so that I just I just don't know. And you know what the truth is? When it comes to near death experiences, I believe in it. I believe in Jesus. I believe he's the only way. But in the end, I don't know because I haven't experienced it. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with saying I don't know because I haven't experienced it, but I believe it's good. Well, my faith is everything else he has told me has come to pass. <laughs> yeah. And he's given me all these good. So that same God has to be right about this issue too. Mm-hmm. I think if we're totally honest, we're all going to be a little nervous at death, a little bit. Uh, my words will probably say, man, I've got to go see what's on the other side. I've got to see now. Because uh, like you said, we have not been there. Right. Um, I can say very boldly that I'm not very much afraid of death at all. Now, I didn't say not at all. I said not very much. Mm. I think for something we've never encountered, we all have a little bit of nervousness, a little bit. But uh, but you're at peace with it. I, but I'm at peace with what, it, yeah. I love what Tom, and I just want to go back to that real quick because I love what you're saying. V- Tiffany's story resonates because she said, "I'm re- like when in the hospital room, it wasn't her time, but she had a piece that went over and she's like, I'm good with it. Like well, if yeah, I die... Yeah. I'm good with it. You, you know, my wife, you, are, you guys all right. know my wife, and a lot of people listen to us might and lot, don't. My wife's a highly educated woman. Right. And uh, my wife challenges all teaching techniques. My wife's a superintendent of school. She's been a, a, a second grade teacher. She's held all these positions. She's not so, a kook. Yeah, well, yeah. She's and, not, and, a, well, I mean, she's not know, a kook. You, she's lived uh, a lot of her years as a non believer and a lot of years as a believer. So as she's putting these stories together, she says, I'm just going to tell you what I experienced. Yeah. And, and, and I can't take it from her. And those stories, yeah, those stories, those experienced stories are hard to argue with. Yeah, I mean, then, right. I, then I have a doctor that told me what happened in the operating room. Right. right. And then when he came through and says, Tom, I got to fix your wife the next day, he hears this story, he goes, I'm not touching her. And I'm thinking, well, then, has she, you know, I've got a medical person that believes she's fixed now. And so I, I, I piece it all together. My wife has never had a surgery since. I mean, I, I look crazy. at this and I'm going, I, 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 and I tell people, and I look at them and I, and I, 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 want, I, I would rather live with my belief system than yes. an unbelief yes. system. We thought Tiffany was going to die for yes. a while. We yeah. really did. Yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was, it, it's one of those things that as you, as you get past it, and that's been 17 years ago, you get past it, you can't get tired of reveling in it. Tom, think, we found something. Yes. And the Bible says explicitly, God says in the Bible, 
that if you seek for me with all your heart, I'll let you find me. You will find me. And we've all done that to a certain degree, and we've found him. And it's this great truth, the gospel, the hilariously good news that we're trying to share, yet a lot of people out there are looking at us in a very suspicious way going, they're loony, they're Mm -hmm. kooks. Well, we're not saying uh, we're not saying this is exactly what it looks like because we don't know exactly what it looks like. We just yeah. believe in it, yeah. and there's a difference between that. I I, I uh, am skeptical about anybody who says this is exactly what it's like, right. and it's black or white. Well, you, nobody you knows know. that. You don't know unless you've experienced it, no. right? And when you no. have experienced something, you know your perspective. But being so. at peace at death is hard for people wherever you're at to yeah. say that you can have peace of de- like. Like again, going back to Tom's story, and then my experience with this thing is when we were, uh, when we had Kendall, my daughter, when she was young, she had to go to the hospital. You drove all the way down to Valley Children's right, Hospital, right. and the doctor came out, similar story, and he's like, she's going to go an operation. And he literally said to us, Hannah and I, we can't tell you what the, like, we don't know what's going to happen. Mm. Like, we have to go in, cut, we might have to cut her intestine because mm. her intestine was tied. We don't know it. And I remember first praying, God, if you can heal, if it's your will, pray. But I remember a specific prayer, and I'm going to actually share this in the marriage retreat. We're going to go a little bit deeper on the marriage retreat. But we said, God, if you take her, we're okay with it. She's yours. And that was the hardest prayer I think I've ever prayed in my life. But I was sincerely believed in it. I had so much peace. And for my wife to have that peace, to say, we're okay with this. Like, you don't pray that prayer. But I said, God, she's yours. She's in your, and, and we were okay. And I think that's what separates believers from non-believers or death. People that have struggled with death or don't struggle with death is having a peace Right, the Bible says we're gonna have a peace that surpasses all knowledge and all understanding. There's no, there's no parent in the right mind that says, okay, like we're gonna survive, like we're gonna be okay with this. And obviously, she's alive today. She's she's 13. She just turned 13. Beautiful young woman. And I'm, you know, I thank God every day for her. But to have that and to be able to have that peace means a lot. Well, what again? And you've heard me repeat this, and I hate to be redundant, but Jesus said on a couple occasions, "Let it be to you according to your faith." Some people might say they don't believe, but they really haven't. They really haven't um, looked in the mirror, so to speak, and asked themselves, do I or don't I? I think a lot of people that have issues, main, major issues with religion or major issues with church, which rightfully so, because there are imperfect people right. uh, in, involved, right? Uh, those people do have a, a desire to believe, at least. And so I think God's grace is going to be larger than we expect. And I want to say people who end. vehemently say, there is no heaven, there is no afterlife. Everybody has doubts. Well, C.S. Lewis wrote so that book. Uh, everybody goes, I think it does. I, but I'm talking about people that adamantly goes, no way. C.S. Lewis wrote that book, The Great Divorce, and it was really interesting. Mm. Um, and it just talked about, it, it painted the picture of somebody who didn't want God in their lives. And um, and they kept making that decision even in the afterlife. And a really interesting perspective. Uh, you know, it's, it's fantasy, but at the same time, it had a lot of reality uh, aspects to it. And so... Who knows, man? Who knows what people think or what they actually believe? Uh, right. you, you learn, like you said, you guys learn a lot at a funeral. You know, you learn a lot. But 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 what hope it gives us in so many areas, yeah. our belief system. I mean, to know in our heart and spirit that our loved one dies and we're going to see them again. Yeah. That's just absolutely crazy. Mm. I mean, what hope it affords you in all areas of life to know, I said before, we do not bury our loved ones who believe in Christ. We plant them because mm-hmm. they're coming back. And there are so many questions that I'm sure audience might have. And again, don't we want to encourage our audience, send us questions yes. about our podcast. Yes. Uh, make comments. Be Feel free to ask questions, and we will try to answer them if you ask them. I want to I end on this going back. Not that you... we, might, we might not have the answer, but then again, we might. I just feel like I have to say this. I don't know why. Um, you talked about the birds in the cage, and you talked about faith. I think when you have faith and you're living, because right now you are alive. The truth is you are alive. And I think when you live and you're living with faith, you're actually a bird out of that cage and you're seeing things that you normally wouldn't see. Right now, if you don't have faith and you're out there and you're don't, you're not sure where you believe, you might be missing out on what God actually has for you. You're the bird that's stuck in the cage and not really seeing what life actually is and what it has to offer. Faith is when you fly. Yes. I like it. Yeah, I want to go back in. I keep going back to my, my other thought. Because I know there's people out there, trolls or whatever, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the heresy trolls again, exist. I am not saying that if you believe in heaven, you're going there. You're going to heaven when you give your life to God. Yes. I just made a point that people say that stuff doesn't exist. Like the test, the story in the Old Testament, a guy said, you know, I, I wouldn't believe there will be food and this will happen. I wouldn't believe it at all. And, of course, they said, you're not going to see it when it happens. And so well, they call anybody it self-fulfilling who... Self-fulfilling prophecy. Self-fulfilling. And that's all I'm saying. 
Uh, but but where do we want to take this? I mean, we got the closing moments, and it's a big, heavy subject. Uh, I just love our belief system, and I I feel very, very, uh, what's the word I want to use? I feel very, very secure in all the proofs even outside of Scripture. But if I've got to choose to believe in Jesus or these scientists who might be atheists who are out there, a lot of them just parroting what they've heard from somebody else. Mm -hmm. They do it all the time. They just parrot it over and over again. Who am I going to believe? And then we also have, like I say, we have these philosophers on our side, some of the smartest minds in the world on our side. We have all this evidence on our side. Right. Well, what I love it is that we're we're sharing what we believe. We're not sharing emphatically what we know because we don't fully no. know exactly everything, but we do believe because of Scripture, because of our relationship with God and our relationship with each other and the and the stories that we talk about and the things that we hear, right? If you have a leader out there and you're following that leader and that leader never says, I don't know, I would be right. careful. Right. I would be very careful. Well, but I, I think, again, Josh, some of these things like the subject today, we're a little more emphatic about what we believe than some other subjects because i've dealt with this like i say i'm somewhat of a pro i've dealt with this for decades i've read every book i can lay my hands yeah. on about death and dying i feel like i have a little more experience because i thought it was going to happen to me soon and i wanted to find out what was on the other side but there are other topics that we cover that we go eh, you know i well, i'm not firm in this yet i have opinion i do believe that faith is hope and action right yes mm. it's it's actually saying, I do believe that God is good. I do believe that we are yes. here for a purpose. I do believe yes. that we live beyond our years. Um, it's a good thing, right? Let me ask you one more question, but just to end this. Would you guys rather have a uh, countdown clock uh, above your head, like in that movie, you know, oh. or would and just knowing when you're going to die, or what, do you like it the way that it is? Can I go back to that song? Again, help <laughs> me out. Who was it? Nickel, Nickelback, I think. Nickelback. Yeah. It was a video, and I wish we could play that again, but I know we have problems with social media. <laughs> we will put and, a link in the notes. Okay, um, for this like Nickelback song. Yeah. Yeah. And what it was, it was a video, and it was about life. And everybody walking around the streets, the marketplace, had numbers that were moving over their head. And those numbers corresponded with how long they had to live on the earth. Yeah. And some people had like two years. One had like two months, one month. One had uh, like one, like five minutes, and they stepped out in front of a car and everybody had the numbers going. That kind of plays it's into the question. Yeah, it's you're interesting asking. because we all do have that. And hopefully that motivates you to live your life the best you can. But to answer your question, no way I want the clock. <laughs> I don't want that would the Ignorance clock would drive me bliss. crazy. Have yeah. you ever thought about in your mind if you could fast forward your your life on a video screen? Yeah. And see if you're still in the picture. You know, I would see, take, if, see if you're still uh, there. Again, I still wouldn't want <laughs> that. I would take I'm it good. because I can use it as a reason to do th what I need to do. You know, yeah. I'm like, no, look, I only have uh, 10 hours left. I got to do this. Yeah. No. <laughs> bucket list. Bucket list. Prioritization. The truth is you've got a clock. You have a clock now. And so you can just use that one well, to do yep. what you're supposed you to know, do. You <laughs> know, I'm changing my bucket list. Yeah. And the older I get, the more I have a desire to start doing some crazy things. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that that I, I, I get the best I can get out of these 85 years that I'm going to have on earth or whatever. And uh, so I don't know how we close this. Tom, well, yeah, what were you well say? I, I just want to go back to what Peter and John said. They've seen too much. Yes, to believe the Lord. <laughs> yeah, they've seen and heard too much. And when you see and hear too much, you, you've got to speak it out. I, we, we, I'm going to proclaim what I believe faith in Christ is going to give me, and it's going to give me eternal life. Yeah. What that looks like, I don't know. Well, but well, let's go it's back, going Tom. to give me yes, let's go back. life after this life. The apostles, these guys, all except for one, they, they, they're historical figures in my mind. I mean, they, they existed. Uh, Paul was no exception. Um, these guys, when they saw Jesus after his death, saw him walk in the room through the wall. They were so convinced that these guys were willing to die. They didn't mind dying. I mean, they all gave their lives for the gospel, going, we don't care because we saw that he was alive after he died, so we're going to be alive after we died. I mean, we got to go down through history and see all these people that were so convinced that they will live after they died that they didn't have to hang on to life with everything they have. It's sad. It breaks my heart today to see people that are trying to hang on 
They're trying to hang on. They, they, they can't get old. They can't age. They can't think about death. There are people who said in funerals sometimes that we do, they're angry. They don't want to be there. They don't want to think about death. They don't like the way we approach the subject. And so I'm just saying to you today that I believe there's some people watching and listening that when they started out, they just kind of, they almost tried to turn us off several times. And now they're thinking, right. maybe these guys are onto something. Mm. I mean, go out and search yeah. it for yourself. Yes, you have to go out and live this out. I mean, you've said one time before, Christianity is like a lab experiment. Yes. You know, you hear it, I yes. get excited about trying it out or looking for an opportunity to try it out. Because I do want to know, I'm a realist. Hey, I, you know, my degree is in computer science. I, you know, I'm logical. But I want to make sure this is right, right. and it works. Yeah. It works. Who is right? The doctor at UCLA told me you will not live past four years, or Jesus who said you will live yeah. 25 years later. Who was right? And here's the question I have for, right? for the skeptic out there, because I am naturally that person. <laughs> What's a better way to live anyway? Yes. Why not? Why? Okay, if we're wrong, we have nothing to lose. If you're wrong, you have everything to lose. Well, if you live in a way that you believe in hope rather than the opposite of hope, yeah. it's probably a better life. Yeah, well, I don't know. Is that it for today? I think that's it. Uh, thank you, guys. We need to talk about living, I think, next time, or maybe in the future. I won't say next time because usually that curses it. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but we don't <laughs> we don't know what we're talking about next week yet, but we will find out, figure it out. And uh, if you want to sing just suggestions. Please. Um, and tell us where you're from again. Yeah. yeah, and thank you guys for all the emails and all of the uh, social media responses and everything, the reviews, everything you guys do. We, we see yeah. them all, and we thank you yeah. guys for all of them. And uh, so, yeah, we'll see. Uh, you know, used to always say here, there, in the air. Yeah, there you go. That's yeah, a good, love you guys. good way to end it. Hey. Your daddy is right.